So thank you all for getting up at uh, 9 o'clock this morning to hear this uh, presentation. And I want to thank the uh, International Association of Hydrogeologists for inviting me to participate here. I am actually wearing two hats. Uh, my institution is Texas A&M University, uh, but I'm also wearing the IWRA, International Water Resources Association hat. Uh, I am president of the association, and I very much appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to work together with this group. And I want to thank Antonia Chambel and uh, Bartolome Andres for this very kind invitation and what I hope is the first of many exchanges and, and collaborations that, uh, between our two organizations. Um, I also want to thank all of you for your tolerance. Um, if you looked at my profile, some of you may be wondering who let the lawyer in. But uh, I want to uh, assure you that I will be not discussing legalese and, and, and breaking down particular regulations and so on. Uh, in fact, what I want to talk about is this interface between law, science, policy, and how this integrates in my work. And also, I'll talk a little bit about the International Water Resources Association and what we do in, in that very same uh, capacity. Um, so, what I do in my work as a lawyer, um, we, we are there to try to help resolve disputes and conflicts and, and, and uh, situations. Uh, but I do have a uh, geology degree, geology background, and I've been I've tried very much to integrate that scientific knowledge into all the, the efforts that I've uh, undertaken over the years. And my specialty area has become transboundary aquifers, transboundary groundwater resources. And this is something that uh, uh, I've looked in uh, for many years, trying to figure out how should nations regulate or manage or cooperate over transboundary aquifers. So what I'd like to do is just give you a little sort of overview of, of some of the work that uh, I, I've been doing. Uh, to maybe give you all a perspective, a different perspective uh, on, on groundwater. Because, you know, when the lawyers come in, you bring in the jurisdictions and the, and the, and the politi politics and, and uh, regulations and rights and so on. But this is reality. Uh, this is the world we live in and uh, we can't have a perfect situation. Uh, my father's a, a hydrogeologist. We have these, these discussions about, well, it's an aquifer, it's a single body, and you can't just put an arbitrary line in the middle. Unfortunately, we do. Uh, and that's the world we live in, that we do put arbitrary lines in the middle of, of uh, water flows, uh, and it is something that we have to deal with in terms of, well, how do we regulate, how do we manage those kinds of situations under this political reality. All right, so the, the first two slides, the, these, are, these are all truisms that all of you know, you know, I'm preaching to the choir, that you all are converts. Groundwater is important. It is the most extracted natural resource in the world. We have people around the world that are absolutely dependent on it. Uh, in some cases, 60, 80, 70, 80 percent. In some cases, 100 percent as their sole source of, of water. And uh, we know that groundwater is at least 100 times more available and I'm just talking about available groundwater, more accessible than surface water. So these are, these are just sort of backgrounds to the, you know, the work that I do that I, I have to consider because I'm the one who does talk to the legislatures and the politicians and the folks that don't have a science background. And so I present this kind of information and the response I get is, well, oh, groundwater, that's a magic bullet. We can solve all the world's water problems with, with groundwater. And then I have to bring in some of the political realities, um, which is, as I said, things like jurisdiction, uh, sovereignty on an international level. On a domestic level, we call it property rights. Uh, and I come from Texas where groundwater, groundwater is a private property right. You own the land, you own the groundwater. That's a whole other conversation that I don't want to get into right now. But these are the kind of political realities we get into. But that's the reality we have in international law. Who owns the groundwater? Well, the state does, the nation does. And when you have an aquifer that is tra tra uh, transboundary, you have issues of ownership between those two countries. So you have to be, be, bring these issues into consideration. There's an example of a, of a uh, cross section of an aquifer, and you have state A and state B. And you have to start thinking about, well, 
Who owns it? Who has a right to it? How do you allocate it in, in a equitable manner or at least in some kind of negotiation in a way that makes sense for the parties so that they don't have a conflict over this water resource? So these are just some of the many questions that you have to, to consider and that, you know, in, in, in my realm, these are the issues that I have to consider, even though I know this is one water body. I know that the water flows naturally. I know that if you put a well in a certain location, you may have a corner depression and you're going to have the, 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 the withdrawal going, could go against the natural flow. But to explain that to, to politicians and to uh, policymakers, uh, this is a challenge. And this is the challenge where, where we have to work on translation and why, you know, I as a lawyer love to come to these types of events to learn so that I can then help to translate this into my work and then into whether it's legislation or treaties or anything of that matter. So with this in mind, some years ago, my uh, father and I, uh, oh, let me, before I uh, forget it. So, well, this is also with my father and I, we started looking at, at transboundary aquifers and trying to think, well, how do you, what do you take into account when you want to assess a transboundary aquifer? Well, you've got to take all the aquifer characteristics and all the information about flow and even chemistry and, and uh, the relationship of the groundwater to surface water and in the hydrocycle and so on. And we came up with a series of models. Um, these are very, what I would call rudimentary uh, I don't want to call them conceptual models, but very rudimentary models of surface water, groundwater relationship when you have a political boundary. Now, we were looking at it in the international context. You can do this in a domestic context. This could be states, this could be cantons, this could be uh, uh, counties. Uh, but the idea is that you put an arbitrary political line in the middle, and then you have to decide, well, how much does side one get? How much does side two get? Well, is this a fossil aquifer where you have virtually no flow, or is this a, uh, uh, a uh, uh, unconfined aquifer that is hydraulically related to a river? Well, is the river domestic, or is the river transboundary? Uh, is the river forming the border of the, of the two states, or is it cutting across the two states? And this we did back in 2000. Uh, five and uh, it's been uh, published fairly widely, but this is the basis, you know, taking this hydrological information and trying to put it into this legal context so that we can then develop legal norms that are actually based in science. And so building on this, we started to expand our search. Well, what else do we have to take into account? And we know that you know, we have the reality of, of, of life. Well, there's social issues, everything from people's needs and agricultural needs, uh, industries, uh, and, and all sorts of issues. And we also have to think, well, this is, this is an international uh, relationship. States are sovereign. They own everything within their jurisdiction. And you have to start looking at, well, how have they acted in the past? What have they done in terms of their actions to manage their resource and maybe even to protect their resource as it relates to their neighbors. And this last point is particularly important for, for me as an international lawyer because international law is primarily based on state practice. It is not what you are used to in terms of how you develop regulations and laws and legislation on a domestic level. On a domestic level, you have a legislature that uh, has a debate and they vote on what the policy and what the law should be. Between nations, typically what happens, we look to see how states have acted. And states tend to act in their best interest. But they're also cognizant, they also recognize that their neighbor is going to act in their best interest, in their own best interest. And so they temper their act actions in relation to how they think their neighbors are going to act. So it used to be that there were principles of absolute sovereignty, the idea that anything in my territory is mine. I don't care if it flows to your territory, but I can do whatever I want. I can dam the river and stop the flow. But they soon realized that they may be upstream on one river, but they're downstream on another river. 
And if they act absolutely in one context, well, somebody else will act, act absolutely against them. And so they started to temper their state actions and develop concepts of cooperation. And you have this, we have over a thousand years of history for surface water, where you have nations cooperating and working together over transboundary rivers and lakes. And we've developed a, a pretty uh, good working relationship that's, that's formed the basis for international law for surface waters. For groundwater, it's another matter. Just consider, we have approximately 310 transboundary water courses, and generally by this I mean rivers and lakes. We have thousands, literally thousands of treaties around the world for transboundary rivers and lakes. So this is an example of state practice. How have the states entered into relationships with their neighbor? And we can learn from all those treaties and all those activities, and we can say, ah, you know, principle of no significant harm. They're, they're going to act in a way that's not going to cause significant harm to their neighbors. That's a legal principle for surface water. For groundwater, you've heard, I'm sure you've all heard the studies that you know, we have 300 and some 10 transboundary water courses, and we have 600 more, maybe even more, transboundary aquifers. So how many treaties do we have around the world? So we have That's it. I used to say you can count the number of treaties for transboundary aquifers on one hand. I have to add a finger now because it's six. Um, we have six formal agreements around the world for transboundary aquifers. I'll show you the list in a minute. Um, we have another four, five, six, what I would call arrangements. These are informal, unofficial relationships where the, the two, two or more states have gotten together and have an arrangement of how to manage that, that water, that groundwater, but it's not a formal treaty, so it's not binding. So if I'm an international lawyer and I'm looking for state practice, I have very, very little to go on to try to identify, well, what rules should apply to transboundary aquifer? And remember, in international law, we don't have a legislature. We look to how states have acted before to develop what are the rules for, for cooperation and for management. So with very little agreements in place, and if you look at the, the way these agreements are structured, I mean, two are only on data sharing. Uh, we really have only two that uh, are truly what I would call management agreements. I mean, there's just very little experience here. Um, and then we have these two other global instruments which are draft articles, so they're not official, which are model provisions, so they're not a formal legal scheme. So we really have very little to work with. So these are just the list. I can actually list all of the treaties on groundwater. I can't do it on surface water. But these are the official treaties for, for, uh, surf, for groundwater resources. These are the ones that are unofficial. And these last two, these are these international guidelines. This is, for an international lawyer, this is very difficult because if I have 600 transboundary aquifers and I only have six treaties as examples to work with, I can't extract uh, practice. The best I can do is what I would call trends. I can suggest, well, maybe based on those six agreements and those four, five, six informal arrangements, maybe I can see where the countries, you know, this is only a, you know, a dozen countries we're talking, 15 countries we're talking about. They do not represent all the 192, 196 nations around the world. But maybe I can come up with, with trends. So one of them is that they're starting to look at aquifer specific agreements and arrangements before Groundwater was a secondary issue in the river agreement. And, and I, when I mean secondary, I mean they mentioned the spring. They didn't have regulations for the groundwater. They just mentioned it as a secondary issue. It wasn't a primary pur purpose of the agreement, and it wasn't the focus of the agreement. Now we're starting to see a few of these agreements come up. And by the way, 
all the formal agreements and all of the informal arrangements, they're all no more than 40 years old, 30 years old, some of them in the last three, four years. Um, this is all a very new, dynamic, developing area of international law. The other area that I would say we have trends is in procedure. And this is how states act in relations to each other, and one of which we see in most of these agreements and arrangements is that they provide prior notification. They let the other state know, before we act, we will let you know that we're doing something with the groundwater. And so there's a, there's a rule of prior notification, exchange of information. Um, most of these states are actually agreeing to exchange information. Now, when I say most of these states, remember, it's only 10, 12, 14 states, 15, 15 nations. It's not representative of the, of, the, of the whole world, but at least it's something where it suggests trends. And then monitoring. Um, the substantive rules, the ones where you, you know, if you want to go to court, you want to have substantive law. This is my right. Uh, you're violating my right to equitable, equitable and reasonable or my no significant harm right. Um, those, are the, those are the principles we see for surface water, for, inter, for, for transboundary water courses. We really don't see them in these transboundary aquifer agreements. We really actually don't see much of substantive rights. Uh, cooperation, to the extent that it's considered a substantive right, you know, thou shalt cooperate. Okay, I'm not sure what that means, but that we see that as an obligation. And the, the first one there, which is probably uh, really troubling uh, to, to many folks, and that is the notion that is a substantive legal matter, we have sovereignty over the groundwater underneath our feet. And that's what the neighbors are also entitled to. From a hydrogeological perspective, how do you manage that? You know the water's going to flow across the border. How do you treat it as a, as a personal or as a state property when you know the groundwater is going to flow? But this is what the nations, at least, are suggesting might be the, the substantive principle. Again, these are trends. I don't know where this is going to go. Um, and there's, we have very little experience uh, to talk about this. But this is where, as I've said, I've tried to, to base these trends and these analyses based on the science, based on hydrogeology, trying to you know, use the models that I showed you earlier. Um, and if, if you're at all interested, um, I actually uh, uh, wrote a book on this, and, and I'll bring it up in a little bit. Um, but I want to move on a little bit to the gaps. So again, based on the science, there's a whole lot of gaps in the existing trends in all these agreements, not many of them, that things that are not being considered. The recharge zone, the discharge zone. Uh, we have one of the guidelines, the draft articles, that does provide protection for, for recharge and discharge zones. But again, that's a draft, it's a guideline. It's, it's, it's not uh, obligatory on nations. Um, Harmonization of metadata. I mean, if you think of that, you want the two sides to use the same standards in order to regulate the aquifer, and that's not a requirement. Um, one of the ones that I personally think is particularly important is cross-border public participation, where you have the stakeholders on both sides of the border participate in the decision-making. You see that in one of these arrangements, not in any of the agreements, not in any of the treaties. Um, but these are, these are gaps in the, the uh, existing regime, to the extent that it's a regime. Um, but this is where, if I'm looking towards the future, this is where the legal profession, the, polit the pol politicians, the legislatures really need to go when they look at transboundary groundwater resources and think about, well, how do we manage them as between nations? So we have a lot of work to do. Uh, we have a lot of work to do with your help, because we need the hydrogeologists, we need the hydrologists, we need the uh, water, the, the, the ecosystem scientists, uh, and, and so on, to help develop these rules in a way that make scientific sense, not just political sense. And as I said, um, if you're at all interested, uh, there's a book, which I'm surprised they didn't bring in uh, to the uh, book fair here, but uh, actually have a discount code on there. If anybody's interested, um, you can certainly get more information on this. Um, 
So as you can see, I hope you can see, is the, my work as a lawyer is really based on uh, my relationship with scientists. It's based on my work, whether it's with my father, who was a professor of hydrogeology for 37 years, and before that he worked uh, uh, in, a, in a state uh, surveys and, and so on around the world. Um, it's my own geology degree uh, that has formed the basis of this, and the folks that I work with uh, and collaborate with, because this is the type of work that can't be developed in, in, in a compartment of, of lawyers. Um, as you can imagine, you know, trying to put a boundary, an artificial boundary on an aquifer is, is, makes no sense from a hydrogeological perspective. Um, but this is the reality that we have to live in. And so uh, the work that I've done has been very interdisciplinary. And because of that work, I'm going to shift the, 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 the presentation a little bit now to my work with the International Water Resource Association. Um, the basis for this organization, this is one of the sister organizations for IAH. Uh, there's a number of them out there. We focus on interdiscipl interdisciplinary work where we want the hydrogeologists, the hydrologists, the economists, the political scientists, uh, the policymakers, the, the, the managers, the engineers, all to come together and uh, cooperate and coordinate on challenges that we have to face on a global level. Uh, clearly, groundwater is one of those critical, critical issues that we are addressing uh, at IWRA. And as I've said before, what my goal during my term as president, I'm hoping that I, we can reach out to organizations like yours and collaborate and work together uh, on some of these issues. In fact, uh, one of the areas that we're going to be starting to look at is groundwater and climate change uh, as a policy matter. So we, we're, we absolutely need to know the science and have the scientists involved in terms of how to develop this issue at, and bring it to a level of policy uh, on a global scale. So we have a, a variety of different, different activities that we do just like you in terms of uh, congresses and, 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 uh, and conferences, uh, we have awards, we have uh, publications, we have uh, all the typical things that an association has like yours. And what I would uh, leave you with is, uh, this is your Congress here today. We have our Congress, uh, which happens only every three years. Our next Congress will happen in uh, Korea, in Daegu, in May of 2020. Um, the uh, abstract deadline it actually closes at the end of this month, so if you at all have any interest, uh, please consider submitting an abstract and join us in Daegu. We would love to have a strong groundwater presence. Uh, we had a very good groundwater presence at the last Congress in Cancun. Uh, some of you may have been there. Uh, we really want a strong presence in, in, um, in Daegu because groundwater, as you all know, I don't need to, to preach to you, is a critical, it's, it may be the most critical uh, water resource as a source of water going forward uh, in the realm, in the context of climate change, in the context of water security, in context of drought, uh, and, and so on. So this is a serious issue that we want to have represented at the Congress, and I would very much welcome you um, uh, to, to join us in Daegu. If you have any questions about the Congress, about IWRA, please see me. Uh, uh, afterwards, I'll be here uh, uh, today. I, unfortunately, I have to leave tomorrow, but I will be here for the rest of the day. Again, I want to thank the International Association of Hydrogeologists as a sister organization for, for my organization, the International Water Resources Association. Uh, we are very, we very much appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all, and we look forward to collaborating uh, in the future, and I want to thank you for your attention.